Hi, this is Ali and you're watching the second video in the series, How Internet is Secured. The series is like a well-built cake and each yummy layer is laid on top of the previous one. I could use example of onion too, but that would leave a bad taste in mouth, so I'll stick with cake. Anyway, the point being, some concepts in this video would be built upon those that were laid out in the previous one, the foundations video. So though not necessary, I would highly recommend you watch that video first if you haven't already. Quick look at the topics covered in this video. We shall look at HTTPS requirements followed by introduction, then TLS introduction followed by detailed look at TLS handshake. We'll briefly talk about session keys and look at a concept called mutual TLS or MTLS for short. You must be familiar with the term HTTP, which is the de facto communication protocol for the internet and powers the World Wide Web. But such communication is similar in nature to talking to your distant neighbor by shouting from top of your roof. All your neighbors in between can listen to what you're talking about. Right, I can stop being overly dramatic and tone it down to anyone with basic hacking skills can monitor your activity online being performed over HTTP. Now that's not too much of an issue if you are say watching this video or reading some online article, but it is a big issue if you are filing your tax return or trying to perform an online banking transaction. Or as simple a case as logging into your email account using your username and password. You wouldn't like to shout out your username and password from top of your house to your neighbor, right? You need secure communication for that. Let's say shouting out was the only way available, just like HTTP. What do you do now? That's where HTTPS comes into the picture. This video is about securing communication being done over HTTP via technologies like HTTPS and TLS. So let's dive in. So HTTPS or HTTP secure is a specialized extension of HTTP as in all communication is done using HTTP under the hood, but with an additional layer of security. This layer is provided by encrypting the content being sent over HTTP by leveraging what is called transport layer security or TLS for short. HTTPS is also sometimes called HTTP over TLS. Now HTTPS and TLS have their prerequisites that needs to be set up. Most modern browsers have all the tools necessary to engage in secure communication with a server that supports it. But it takes two to tango and server needs to be properly set up to engage in secure communication. In fact, the web pages that use HTTPS have a special URL prefixed with HTTPS and your browser shows a lock icon near URL address bar to indicate a secure page. You can see it in action by trying to access your email via browser and see the lock icon on the page where you provide your password. When you navigate to a secure page and before any sensitive communication takes place, the client and server needs to perform a sort of handshake and establish a secure line over which to communicate. The end goal of handshake is to come up with a mutually agreed upon encryption key to encrypt and decrypt content messages. Let's explore how it happens. So we'll take a detailed overview of TLS Handshake. TLS Handshake is a sequence of steps in order to be performed by client and server to establish the secure line. The client starts with a client hello message and includes in the message the highest TLS version it supports, a random number, the encryption tag or cipher suite to use, application layer protocol, let's say client wants to use HTTP2, and a session ID if client is trying to resume a broken handshake. The server responds with its own server hello message, which includes the chosen TLS version, a server random number, chosen cipher suite, and compression method. In the same breath, server also sent its server certificate used for authentication via public key by the client. The client performs validation of certificate. You can refer to foundations video for how this is done as I won't be going into details here. Bottom line, the client authenticates the server at this point to ensure it is indeed the intended target of communication. This is followed by something called client key exchange message from the client, which includes what is called a pre-master secret, which is a random alphanumeric string client creates. That secret is encoded by the public key of server obtained from its certificate in previous step. The server would be able to decode using its private key. 
This is where things start getting interesting. Both client and server have the pre-master secret. Both of them use that and information exchange above to compute a master key. The inputs to algorithm that creates the master key include the pre-master secret as well as the client random number and server random number. The master key, which is a 48-bit key, is now available with both client and the server and is used to generate a set of three keys for each side, client and server. The keys are a write key for both client and server, a write MAC key for each side, and optionally an initialization vector key required by some cipher suites. These are generally known as session keys and would be used for encrypting the content messages going forward. The client now sends the change cipher spec message, essentially telling server that client is ready to communicate with the session key. This is accompanied by finished message from the client where client creates the hash of all messages exchanged so far, encrypts that hash with the session key generated and send it to the server. If the server came up with the same session key on its side, it would be able to decode the hash and validate it by creating a hash of previous messages on its side. In the same breath, it would be able to authenticate the client as only the client with all messages so far would be able to come up with the same session key. The server now proves its own authenticity by sending the hash of earlier communication to client in encoded form with the session key. This is done in the form of a server finished message. The purpose of finished message is to ensure some attacker didn't intervene in middle of handshake. So it's of hash of all previous communication available to both sides. It also ensures both sides now have the same session key to encode messages with. Voila, the handshake is finished and the secure line exists and session keys are there to encode the messages with. You must be wondering why we use the smaller length session keys and not the asymmetric keys for encoding messages. The answer is economics and practicality. The message length after encoding with 1024 or 2048 bit public key is really large to be feasible for large communication. Also the encoding algorithm with asymmetric keys is slow with these large keys. The TLS protocol end result is a set of short-lived session keys which are generated after the careful handshake discussed earlier. If you notice, that key is not communicated over the wire at all, so it can't be intercepted. They provide faster and shorter encoding output. The MAC write keys are used to digitally sign the messages as well, so integrity of content messages is also ensured. For most cases involving secure communication, it is usually the server website which needs to be secure and reliable, and it usually does not care where the request is coming from. Such servers like banking websites or email providers would establish HTTPS connection with any client on the web. The client needs to validate the server certificates and authenticate them during handshake. However, there are cases where both sides need to know who they are talking to. For example, if a banking server is trying to communicate with servers and individual branches, then it would need to authenticate the client as well to ensure it is the branch server communicating with it and not some hacker from an internet cafe. Same example can be extended to IoT devices that are sending data over to a cloud-based web server or microservices communicating with each other. This is achieved by something called mutual TLS or MTLS for short, which is a step up version of TLS discussed earlier, the only difference being that both sides provide certificates to authenticate themselves. But does it mean each IoT device and microservice need to register itself with high and mighty certificate authority? The answer might surprise you. Certificate authorities are trusted providers of digital certificates. To be a root certificate authority and be part of the browser software, the authority does need to be high and mighty large organization with a repute to upkeep. But for servers or microservices communicating within an organization, the organization can itself take the role of certificate authority. It can even come down to your home where you have a laptop acting as a server for monitoring temperature in each of your rooms via individual sensors. 
you can create a certificate authority on your laptop and start issuing root certificates from that certificate authority. You own the devices. They would trust the CA you tell them to trust, even if you created them at home. This video won't go into details on how to create a certificate authority and dole out certificates, including root certificates. You can look it up. It just takes a few commands and no fancy office. Once ready, you can issue certificates for servers and devices under your control. All left to do is configure your servers and client to engage in mutual TLS rather than TLS. Right after the step where server presents its certificate and client authenticates, the client would present its own certificate and server would authenticate. That's the only difference and everything else remains the same. That's it for this video. In the next one, we shall look into identification, authentication, and authorization, their definitions, differences, best practices, and workflow. If you like the content, please like and subscribe to be notified of new content. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.